Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part two of my Star Wars Episode 7 BB-8 droid, which is the ball droid that rolls along on a ball with its dome on top. So um, last time I built this assembly, we've got a ball, which is polystyrene, with um, some liquid latex coating it, so it's nice and grippy and rubbery. And I made this little robot with four omnidirectional wheels and some electronics, well, hey, which is going to actively balance on top of the ball, which is currently balanced on a bucket so it doesn't fall over. So, um, a few things to say first of all. So, um, I published a video the day after some video came out from Star Wars Celebration at uh, Anaheim, where they produced an actual practical prop of BB-8 that went around the stage and it was very good. So obviously I started making my projects long before that. Obviously I didn't just buy the parts and have them shipped overnight from the US and put it all together in response to that video. I'd started several weeks before. So obviously I hadn't seen that video at the time and I had this idea of how to make the droid and I'm going to continue with it anyway. But after that, there is gonna be probably a version two. Uh, but for now, everyone can stop the comments saying, have you seen the video of Anaheim? And sort of telling me that it's different because you know I've made a robot that balances on a ball so I can see it's different. Also, I just wanted to address some comments um, so basically the point is this ball is lightweight so it hasn't got much inertia and it moves quickly and the robot on top can uh, basically keep balance and move the ball quickly without too much inertia so the robot keeps the inertia to stay stable and the ball moves underneath and doesn't have the inertia. Several people have said why don't I make the ball heavy for stability obviously if it was heavy if it's really heavy like it's concrete the robot would just drive off the edge and the ball wouldn't move. Um, and some people have said, why don't I put a heavier ball or ball bearings inside this ball to keep the weight down? But obviously that's gonna make it really unpredictable to move and we can have a quick look at what happens when you put a ball inside a ball. So I haven't actually got a ball to demonstrate with. I've got half a ball, um, which if you move it around um, and let gravity take its course, you know, it does uh, what you expect and it rolls around. And if it were a whole ball without this rim, it obviously would roll along as you'd expect it to. I haven't got a ball to put inside, but I have got something round, so we'll just test it in one axis. Obviously, it makes it do really weird stuff. So if you imagine that being a ball and rolling in both directions, you know, that's balancing something on top of that um, is going to be even harder. And the bigger the mass of the ball here, and obviously the bigger and smaller the gap, the weirder it's going to get. So um, obviously the robot does the balancing, the ball doesn't do the balancing. And the ball's light, the robot's heavy, so it can keep balance. Obviously it's really hard to run with concrete boots on because the weight's really low and it trips you up, so you want lightweight feet. So here's a robot in its current form. I've got actually currently an Arduino Uno on here. I have got the SparkFun Electronics Arduino Pro Mini. And the red board is actually its programmer board, which comes off, so it's actually really tiny. And this is eventually going to be fitted on the breadboard there. Uh, but for now, I didn't want to break the connector through repeated reprogramming, because I'm doing most of this through trial and error. And the Arduino Uno's got a nice big USB B on it, uh, so it's far easier to frequently unplug and plug in. Eventually, when I've got the code sorted, this will be going on there instead. We've got um, the rest of the parts. I've put a full list on the website. If you check out the link in the description, um, with links to SparkFun's website where most of the electronics come from. We've got um, a 9 axis accelerometer gyro magnetometer for w from which we're using the accelerometer and the gyro. The level shifter there is because the Arduino is 5 volts and the in inertial measurement unit is 3.3 volts. Underneath here we've got a motor controller board which is the Rover 5 board and that's all wired in so that's a PWM driven board that will drive four motors which is ideal for our four wheels. The only thing I have done since last time is swap the motors so I started with uh, motors which are 15 to 1, these are MFA Como drills 918D geared motors. I started with 15 to 1 ratio and I found that basically they didn't give enough torque at low speed so I've changed these to 100 to 1 geared motors um, which are now perfectly adequate. Um, and those run on 12 to, or 6 to 24 volts, the motor controller only does up to 12. So, um, in fact, I've got this balancing in one axis, and we'll have a look at the code a bit later on. But for now, let's see what it does. So I've got my ball constrained between two bits of wood and another piece of wood underneath, so it thinks that the floor is a smooth floor. Obviously, on carpet, it is um, easier to calibrate because the carpet has some dampening because it's soft. So obviously, I want it to work on smooth floor, so I've set up a bit of smooth floor. I've also propped up one end with some white stuff to level it up with the spirit level, otherwise it will never hit its dead spot. So um, as you can see, it's actually settled there. 
You maybe just hear the PWM of one motor. If I give it a shove, then we should be able to see it balancing quite well on the ball. At least that's the Y axis. And I haven't done the code for the X axis yet. So it's pretty stable. I haven't um, tuned the PID loop up completely as much as I'm happy with. It would be ideal if it um, obviously settled by itself, which is quite hard to do on a smooth floor, so I'm not too unhappy. But um, almost. There we go. So um, there are in fact, there we go. So there's a few settings um, to dampen that down so it can settle much quicker. Uh, but for now, I'm pretty happy with it. So I think I'll get both axes working because that's going to have some influence on the sensors once it's balancing in two directions. Then we'll fine tune it. Oh, there we go again. So obviously part of the reason that the droid is able to settle completely stationary um, in that bit of video is due to the, the uh, bit of wood gripping the ball each side which causes some extra friction and means it can settle. It's probably not going to settle in both axes once it's on the smooth floor. It's probably going to have to constantly move to stay stable. So I've actually been working on the code for the other axis so we can have a look at that now. So far it only works on carpet which provides a little bit of dampening, a lot more than a smooth floor anyway, which makes it slightly easier to balance. So we can see it's um, just about balancing okay there. There's a few oscillations um, in one of the axes and they're tuned quite differently. There's a few different settings um, throughout the code which we'll cover at the end for anyone who really wants to know how it works. And I will be publishing all the code so anyone who wants to build one or a two-wheel balancing robot can um, reuse the code with some adjustments I expect. But um, I am finding one axis either more sensitive or one motor is slightly faster on one axis which um, means the settings are different. But on the whole I'm not too unhappy with the way it balances. There's a few oscillations which probably still need tuning out. Um, it's using quite short fast motions to balance. And that's because the motors only go so fast. I'd quite like um, much smoother sweeping motions to try and keep it on balance. Um, but if I let it go off balance too far, then the motors aren't fast enough, in fact, to uh, bring it back on balance. So at the moment it's using lots of small jerks to try and get itself to the dead spot. So I'm not too unhappy with that for the initial bit of code. It is actually possible to make a balancing robot that corrects its position so quickly you can't see it. So all you see is it slightly drifting around very slowly instead of jerking around trying to balance like a person would. Um, and that's been demonstrated obviously by Segway scooters which you just leave them standing there. They pretty much stand up stationary by themselves and they certainly don't jerk around like that when you ride on them. However for a 16 megahertz Arduino and DC motors what I've got here isn't too bad. What we really need is motors that we can position accurately with wheeling code or we use stepper motors or some sort of AC synchronous motor that we can drive to an exact position to correct the error. We also probably need a faster processor so I might consider parallel processing with two Arduinos, one for each axis in the future. But for now um, that's pretty much it. There are other things we can do. So at the moment I mentioned the ball is light and the robot is heavy so that it can push the ball under itself quickly and the robot stays in position because it's got the inertia. So we could try adding more weight to the top to the robot. Uh, we can't make the ball much lighter though. Obviously if the ball's heavier it will require more force so it'll be harder to control and that's why the ball is nice and lightweight. So the next thing I'm going to do in this video is try and get the dome mounted which I've got just here which needs to be at just the right height to cover it and we need some sort of skirt around it that's going to hide the wheels. So let's have a look at some CAD for that. So here we go, we've got the dome here which is a representation of the dome I've got um, which basically we don't need to print of course because we've already got the acrylic dome and I've um, made the model clear so we can see through it and see how it fits but if we just get rid of that then we need this base with a flange at the bottom. Um, my flange isn't quite as steep as the actual BB-8 one because um, it, the wheels won't fit inside basically. It can't go in so much at the bottom, so I've done it at 45 degrees. It looks about probably 30 degrees in the real one. But I have allowed for that kind of brim that's painted silver around the edge. And of course I've made a mounting there to fit the uh, dome on the top. So this has um, been split up into four sections. 
so that we can print it um, print quarters at a time on the 3D print bed and then stick them all together afterwards and I'm going to print these in ABS plastic so they can be solvent welded together with acetone. So I'm just sorting out that ring there, just um, solvent welding with acetone all of the parts together to make the ring. And I got thinking about the wheels, so they currently drop down so that they grip the ball. Uh, but obviously with this ring and the flange, if I pick the thing up, they're going to hit on the bottom of this skirt. So I decided to suspend them with elastic bands. So I've just installed an elastic band on each one. So they can still drop down a bit. Um, in all fairness, they're actually quite even and they all grip the ball but just so when I pick it up they don't hit the skirt with the wheels running. I've also made another discovery which is that these wheels are quite loose. So looking at it this way, they, there's quite a bit of sideways wiggle in them um, and some are worse than others. So I've actually printed these little wedges which just go either side just so the wheel can move up and down but it can't move sideways too much. And I'm hoping that's going to kill some of the oscillations and the issues that I've seen. I've just fitted my skirt there and I've made these parts which are little bridge parts which um, just hold that on and it's only supporting itself and it'll be supporting the dome and what I've cunningly done is made sure that I can actually get the wheels to fold up like so. So um, basically I can actually get to the motors to change them if I have to and the wheels so I don't have to make this piece removable. There's the top, so when it's flat on the table the wheels actually touch the ground and there is a slight bit of clearance, but obviously on the ball there's much more because the ball slopes away. And my dome fits neatly on top on that rim that I made, perfectly on top. So that's really easy to remove and put on and of course this is going to be painted up to look like BB-8's head. So it's looking not too bad, that is basically the best I can tune the parameters up with the current speed of the motors. Um, obviously adding a bit more weight to the top there in the form of the dome and the skirt has given it some more mass so it doesn't move quite as quick. And also putting those black wedges in has really helped with the wheel wobble. So there's hardly any oscillation now, only a tiny amount which is actually the wheels turning rather than them wobbling. So that's part of the PID loop settings. So it's made it quite a lot easier to tune up those parameters and make it balance. And you can see that it sort of deadens its um, oscillations. Sometimes it makes a really big movement, but then the next one is small, so those um, errors don't build up. And overall it stays stable, so I'm pretty happy with that. In a moment I'm going to go through the Arduino code for this, which is also going to be given away for free, mainly because I took lots of other people's codes from around the internet, including the example code for the inertial measurement unit from SparkFun Electronics. So basically that's then going to be republished for free on my GitHub, so have a look at the link in the description to my website where you can find the links to everything. I'm also releasing the CAD files for this as well because there's not much to it. So I'm going to make several improvements to this next time. Uh, there's several things we need to do. I think I need to run the motors a bit quicker. These motors actually go up to 24 volts. And I've got two 11.1 um, volt LiPos on board. So it makes sense to use all of that to drive the motors. Now unfortunately the Rover 5 motor controller board only does 12 volts. So we're going to have to do a fix for that so we can run the motors faster. Then I think I can get smoother sweeping motions rather than lots of short jerks to bring it on centre. Which is going to make it look a bit more like a friendly robot. The other thing I'd really like to do is um, raising up the inertial measurement unit on a stick. So that means that it'll have um, a greater rate of change because the angle will be bigger as the robot moves off centre. So it already has the pivot point to the centre of the ball, which is about 30 centimetres. And I think if I can bring it up maybe another 20 centimetres, then perhaps we can get almost double the resolution on the accuracy from that gyro because it'll be moving further. Now fortunately BB-8 has some aerials on its head which we can use. Um, it's not going to be quite movie accurate but we're probably going to have quite a thick stick with the inertial measurement unit mounted above its head but I think it's going to look fine once the head is done up with all the other features of BB-8 so we're going to try that next time as well. Alright so let's have a look at the code. 
I'm using Arduino 1.0.6 to write the code here. I found some issues with the inertial measurement unit library and um, the later version, but this one seems to work perfectly well. So first of all, we've included the I squared C and the SPI library that are both required for the inertial measurement unit library to compile. Um, even though we're only using I squared C hookup for this, as per the hookup guide on the SparkFun website, we actually need them both to be there. We've also included the library for the inertial measurement unit itself, and I've put the link there to the latest version on SparkFun's GitHub. I'm also using the PID library for control, and again, I've put the link there where you can find out all about that. So the first things here are setting up the inertial measurement unit, which is all stripped out of the basic example that comes with that piece of hardware. I've got quite a lot of variables um, declared here. I'm using millis to do the timing here rather than delay. So we've got um, basically the previous and current millis and an interval which is basically how often we're going to sample the sensors and do the calculations and that's set to 10 milliseconds. We've also got dt which has to be in seconds so that's 0.01 which is again 10 milliseconds which is used for the complementary filter to integrate over the same time period. I've got a lot of float variables which are for the accelerometer gyro data and the mix of both and another set called XYZ. So there's some excessive variables in here and I've um, often just used extra variables to make the code easier to understand. We've also got pitch and roll, which are a combination of all of three of the accelerometers to get the pitch and roll variables. And we've then got variables for the four PWM values for the motors. So I've got a dead spot declared there, which is three degrees, um, and that's a mix of the gyro and accelerometer. So that's partially degrees per second and partially actual degrees. I've got a variable called motor start, which I've set to zero, and I was experimenting with starting the motor not at a PWM value of zero, because at maybe one or two PWM value, it doesn't move at all or very fast. But I ended up setting that back to zero to make the motions a bit smoother. And I've also got this motor gain variable, which we'll look at later, but essentially that is another scalar on the output of the PID loop. We've then got the input, output, and set point for the two PID loops for the two axes and eventually we set up those PID loops. So we're just gonna quickly look at Wikipedia. So a PID controller stands for proportional integral and derivative, and it briefly describes um, what happens here. So um, it says obviously proportional is um, depending on the present error, so it basically gives you a gain based on how much error needs to be fixed. The um, integral is the accumulation of past errors, and derivative is a prediction of future errors based on the current rate of change. And there's quite a lot of reading to do here. It does define them um, in better detail. And um, I'll tell you what the results of setting those values are a little later. Going back to the code, we've um, got the PID set up here and we've got the P, I and D values, which we'll talk about, as I say, in a moment. So then we've got our setup function. We've declared various pins as output, which are the eight pins, four PWMs and four digital pins to control the motor controller. I've also set the set points of the PID loop. So basically we want this to center around zero uh, with a positive and negative swing. So we've set the set points to zero and we've set the output limits of the PID loop to plus and minus 255, so it swings around zero. And of course zero is where we want the motors to stop when it's in the middle. We've got a serial function here to um, set up the serial comms so we can look at stuff in a serial terminal. Um, the, there are various serial comments further down which are greyed out and those are mainly for debugging, but I've left this in here anyway just in case you need to monitor those values. This piece here is um, basically initialising the inertial measurement unit, as the comment says there, which again I've stripped out of the example from SparkFun. Then we go into our main loop. The first thing here is reading the gyro, and it's taking calculated values that gives us degrees per second, so it gives us a rate of rotation. What you'll actually find is that the X gyro is not in the same axis as the X accelerometer, and this is intentional. So on the board there is a little diagram with two arrows and one pointing up, so for X, Y and Z coordinates, and some rotation marks for X, Y and Z. And in fact the arrows are for the accelerometer and the rotation marks are for the gyro. Um, so basically what I've done is read my Y gyro from the X variable and my X gyro from the Y variable so that my X and Y then matches and I don't get really confused. So um, I've also had to multiply the X variable for the gyro by minus one to invert it because I found in fact it went in the opposite direction to the accelerometer for that axis. 
So um, those are things worth watching out for. Those errors are intentional and it is quite confusing otherwise. And that is the way the manufacturer built that inertial measurement unit. We then read the accelerometer into the acceler accelerometer values. And again, we've used the calculation there, which is from the SparkFun library for the inertial measurement unit, which gives us actual degrees. Um, and if we monitor those with the serial terminal, then we can actually move that board around and it'll tell us how many degrees we've rotated it to, simply put. I've got some error correction here, so uh, probably I haven't mounted the unit totally flat on the robot and the robot's not totally flat on a flat surface. So I've got some error correction for each of the accelerometer and gyros. And you can uncomment the serial print so that you can monitor it. The next part of the code here calculates the pitch and roll. Um, what I've done is just taken the accelerometer x, y and z variables and just turned those into shorter variables called x, y and z, which makes this block of code look a lot cleaner. And this again is taken from the SparkFun simple example. Uh, basically it combines all three accelerometers to get pitch and roll. So basically it gives us some more accurate readings for the x and y tilt. And again I've corrected the output here, perhaps my robot isn't totally flat or something's going on but I've basically monitored those values in a serial terminal and put some corrections in there so they come out exactly to zero. And then the fun begins and this is where we actually do the work. So our, um, we've got the timer set up here so we've got a current millis equals millis which bookmarks the current time and then it says if an amount of time has elapsed, the interval which we've set to 10 milliseconds, then do some stuff. It also makes another bookmark so it can then time another 10 milliseconds later on the next loop round. So the first two lines here are complementary filters. So you may have read about Kalman filters for mixing accelerometers and gyros. The complementary filter is a much simpler, less processor intensive way of doing it. And you can find this calculation from multiple places on the internet. Uh, basically the gyro is accurate, but it creeps because it only gives us a reading when it's moving. The accelerometer is not accurate, it's much slower, but it does know which way up is. So we're mixing these two values together, but also find there's quite a lot of noise in both of them from vibrations. So um, this function basically integrates over time, dt, which we've set to 0 0.01 seconds, which is again 10 milliseconds, and it's iterative, so it takes the um, output of itself, mix y, and mixes it back into the calculation. So it basically averages out values and throws away the crazy ones. It then takes 98% of that gyro smoothed value and adds it to 2% of the accelerometer. And that gives us a fairly good um, idea of the X and Y from the mix of the pitch and roll and the gyro values. We then run the PID loop. So um, I've, again, I've used some extra variables and you could strip some of these out. So I've said that um, the input to the PID loop is the same as the mix Y and the input to the other PID loop is the same as mix X. We then do the PID compute and basically that gives us um, an output. And now looking back at the PID loop, our P, I and D settings, which are up here, which I've got set to 8, 0 and 0 0.4. So the first one is the proportional gain, which is an amount of gain we need to fix the error. It's also multiplied by the motor gain variable of 9 because I found that um, I had to set this value really high to actually get any decent wheel movement. So um, the integral is zero, and I read that that value should be low for better control. If you open that value up and make it a bit higher, then the um, PID loop tends to overshoot, so it makes it more sloppy. It smooths out the motions a lot, so they'll probably put a value in there when my motors move faster, but for now it means that um, it overshoots and the error gets bigger and bigger and eventually the robot can't catch itself. The derivative value of 0.4 here basically changes the ramp of how quickly it ramps up that motor and shuts it down again. So it makes it more sort of juddery, but it does make it more accurate. So you need to balance all three of those, as well as the dead spot here, which is obviously um, set to plus minus three degrees, so that um, you can hit that dead spot and that deadens all the motion. And that's basically how the whole thing is controlled. After we've calculated our PID settings and we've got our output Y, I've used an absolute value of y, which always makes that value positive. So if you remember, the PID loop swings around zero with a positive and negative value of plus and minus 255, but we want that to center on zero. Um, and we also want it always to be positive to actually drive the wheels, which is why we've got this abs command here. Um, I've then multiplied it by the motor gain to make it much, much bigger. 
I also experimented with this motor start variable I mentioned, which um, basically means we don't want to start the motors necessarily at a value of zero or one, because it doesn't actually turn the motors. As it is, I've left it at zero and let the PID loop take care of it, but we could start the motors at, say, a value of five. Um, and if we had a much bigger dead spot, that might be advantageous. I've then made sure I've constrained my output so that it's always between zero and 255, which is the biggest variable we can put into the PID loop. And then I've said that channel 3 equals channel 2, so the opposing wheels always spin at the same speed. Then we need to turn the actual wheels. So I've got some if statements here, and I've got a dead spot set. So if the output from the PID loop is less than the dead spot times minus 1, so a negative value, then basically turn the two outputs high, which are the direction pins on the motor controller, and write the PWM values. If the output is greater than the dead spot value, which I'm using as 3, so it's minus 3 and 3, then basically do the opposite, so turn them the opposite way, and again write those PWM values. If it's within the dead spot, so else, then analog write zero to both, which turns both um, inputs to zero and makes the wheel stop. We then of course do the same thing for the other two channels for the opposing axis, again with the output X and the other PWM and digital pins. And that's pretty much the end of the loop. If you want to get hold of the code, have a look at xrobots.co.uk slash bb8 with two capital Bs, and you'll find this article. We've got um, the first section there is what we did in part one, which was building the robot. And if you look at the coding and electronics section, um, there's some more pictures. There'll be some more on this page by the time it goes live. And this big pink box will be a link to GitHub where you can find the code and also the 3D CAD files in Autodesk 123D format, which is free software. So that's the end of this video. Check back in part three for some more refining and hopefully some radio control.